A question people often ask me is, hey Karku, which support hero is the best to climb with in gold, plat, diamond, or whatever rank they're at? And my biased answer is usually Zenyatta because his raw damage output can single-handedly carry a team. But then, I discovered Funny Astro, a dude who hit rank 1, 3, 4, and 6 at the same time playing Lucio, and it got me thinking, how on earth does he play Lucio so effectively in solo queue that he's able to consistently hit top 10? What is he doing differently? I know when I play Lucio, there are games where I just feel so helpless, and I'm sure some of you guys can relate. So, how do you create the same impact as this dude in Climb Up and Ranked? My name is CarQ, and let's find out. So first, let's introduce the man himself who's gonna help me co-commentate this Lucio guide. Hi guys, I'm Funny Astro, the notorious Lucio one trick on EU ladder. Currently a full-time streamer, but was formerly a professional player for British Hurricane, the London Spitfire Academy team. Jumping right into things, I asked Funny Astro what his playstyle approach is when playing comp. Are you supposed to play safe and peel, or are you supposed to play aggressive and wall right to their backline and go for those Reddit Lucio boops? Generally, I think playing aggressive normally works better, but there's this fine line between uh, feeding and then playing with your team. Playing confident in ranked is the way to go. If you see a flanker behind your team, you should just need to run into them. Playing alpha is f and they'll be scared for the rest of the game. They won't come on the flank again. It also depends on what the enemy team is running. For example, if they have a McCree that can flashbang you and stun you out of the air, you want to make sure you stay out of his range. So the takeaway point is this. During our conversation, Funny Astro did state that when he played for his contenders team, he peeled a lot more and played as a unit. But for the purposes of the ranked ladder, which applies to 99.9% .9 of you guys, playing aggressive can grant you the playmaking potential you otherwise wouldn't be able to find, along with winning the psychological battle. Like he said, challenging flankers and playing alpha as f will cause enemies to play more passive or scared, knowing that they can't flank around uncontested. So instead of letting a tracer, for example, roam around freely and you as Lucio sitting there waiting to boop her away from your backline, just skid around the map and find her first before she gets there. You know, fire a few shots at her here and there, and force her to have to look for health packs or healing from her team before ever committing. It's kind of like you're peeling before you actually even need to peel filling that peeling role, but look at where you're positioned now, right? This draws the enemy attention towards you and away from your vulnerable teammates, thus creating space and really adding immeasurable value to your team. Now, like I said though, this is a video on Lucio for the rank ladder specifically, and because you're almost always going to be matched up with different enemies every time you queue up, there are a few tips you can learn to abuse this. You can also take advantage of the fact that people just straight up don't learn in rank You'd be surprised how slow people are to adapt. Just look at this clip. I booped three people in the same spot and still no one is checking for me. Spawn camping's pretty good as well. If your team manages to get a late pick on someone you can confidently 1v1, you can run into the enemy spawn and make sure that they don't get back to the fight so that you can take a free 5v6. For example, I'd normally go for a 1v1 with pretty much any hero that's coming out of spawn, apart from Hanzo or Sombra or maybe Soldier. In general, it just depends on how confident you are in your own ability. And there it is, two big ladder specific tips. Learn a couple of common boop spots and abuse it over and over again. Queue up for another game after, and you've got a fresh new batch of enemies to rinse and repeat. It's like that famous quote, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, I'm stuck in bronze. Or something like that. To add to the second tip, spawn camping is a legitimate strategy and tactic if you know how to consistently 1v1 enemies without dying. Sometimes you don't even necessarily have to kill them, but disrupt them enough that they're forced to go back to spawn to heal or draw another teammate to come and help them. If that's the case, then you did your job. You made it a 5v4 for the rest of your team. Now on the topic of 1v1s, I asked Funny Astro what his approach is with aura flicking in these situations. In case you don't know, aura flicking is just a technique that you may have seen a lot of Lucios employ where you always switch between speed aura, back to heal aura, back to speed, back to heal. I was curious to know if there's any specific reasoning or thought process behind it. I'll be honest, I randomly flick the auras in a 1v1, because it depends on how often I hit the damn button since it's on my shift key and I have to stretch my pinky finger. The random aura changes often disorient the enemy. Suddenly you're quicker, suddenly you're slower. You can squeeze in a bit of healing and it generally makes your movement unpredictable. How can the enemy predict your random movement when you can't even predict it yourself? However, when using your amp, I wouldn't recommend flicking your auras when playing with your team, because it can really confuse your teammates. For example, if your Renzaria is looking to engage with a speed amp, then you suddenly switch to heal, you'll just end up baiting them to go in. 
This leads us to the topic of sound barrier usage and when and what to use it against. So generally it's good to use sound barrier to engage when you know that the enemy don't have many ultimates up or when they've wasted some cooldowns. For example, if they use an Ananade way before the fight, you can engage because you know they have less healing. When using your beat defensively, you should ideally look to counter powerful offensive ultimates like the Grav or Nanoblade combos, especially if you're the only defensive ultimate. You have a bit more leverage if your team is running two defensive ultimates like Zen's Transcendence along with your sound barrier. However, there are so many factors to consider. There are times where you might not even want to beat defensively against big offensive ultimates because it might not be enough to live. It can depend if other people are shooting into it and who else is alive on both teams. In general, the easiest way to learn how to use your beat is just to think about whether you actually needed it after the fight is over. Every situation is different with all those variables, so be honest with yourself and it will help you learn your sound barrier discipline over time. That's right, the common advice you often hear many people preach is that you always need to use your defensive alt like Sound Barrier or Transcendence against Graviton Surge for example, and then many people kind of fall into this habit of instinctively using it the moment they see or hear it without looking at the context of the fight or the team comp. It's not wrong advice per se, like there's definitely times where it's absolutely correct in those situations, but if you truly want to improve and climb beyond your ranks as Lucio, take Funny Astro's advice to heart and truly assess each and every sand barrier you use after a team fight is over. Was it wasted? Did you get value out of it? Once you get better at assessing the immediate threat levels and understanding your ultimate economy, like just conceding the fight and saving the sound barrier and using it offensively to engage next fight, you'll find yourself creating that impact that genuinely wins you more games. I also do want to mention that using your sound barrier after the enemy uses theirs generally gives your team a better chance of winning a fight. This is because your team gets the shield for a little bit longer. As long as you don't hold on to it too long, or you're too late, you should be fine. Now this is another very interesting point. Uh, there was a tweet by Washington Justice's assistant coach, Avala, who brought up a little thinking exercise regarding Lucio's dropping the beat in a GOAT's mirror matchup, and what had the highest win percentage. The options are number one, engage a fight with the beat. Number two, sustain or keep up a team fight with the beat. Number three, countering a Graviton and Diva Bomber Earth Shatter combo with the beat. And number four, using the beat second after the enemy beats or uses Transcendence. Now, I'm gonna bring this exercise to you guys as well. Try to order them from the highest win percentage to the lowest. I'll let you guys think about it for about five seconds or you can pause the video. And time's up. With the data from the games Avala analyzed, she found that, number one, engaging a fight with the sound barrier had them win 80% of the time, often because the enemy team would see the beat and wait for it to expire before committing the grab combo, and the team that engaged with it would often kill one or more players within its duration, leading to a more advantageous fight. Number two is actually using the beat second after the enemy beat for Transcendence with a 66% win rate. This is what Funny Asher was saying earlier through his experience, and it holds true to the analyzed data here. Using the beat second gives you that extra HP for a little bit longer and often gives teams enough time to break the enemy front lines. Number three is using the beat to counter Graviton and Diva Bomb or Shatter combo with a 47% win rate. This is an interesting one, and as Avala stated, using the sound barrier in these situations often isn't enough because sometimes the beat needed to be used just to sustain the oncoming damage in the grab itself, or the beat timing was poor, or the Rhine's Aria was pinned and couldn't shield. And number four, teams that used the beat to just sustain or keep up in a fight had a 26% chance of winning the fight. And based on the analysis, they noticed that teams that resorted to using it like this were often in a situation where they were already low or down a player or in a bad position. Remember, there's always context to a team fight. I mean, Overwatch is such a dynamic game and it's just food for thought to kind of help you think about your sound barrier usage beyond strictly countering offensive ultimates. Now onto the final section of this video, I asked Funny Astro if there were any final tips he could give to all of you on some topics we haven't touched on yet. Tip number one, wall riding. Uh, so wall riding should just be something that you practice and watch streams until it comes naturally to you. One thing though, backwards wall riding is off by default and you should definitely turn it on. It's essential. Movement should become so natural that you have to spend less brain resources on thinking about how you're moving and more on aiming and positioning and helping your team as much as you can. That's right, kind of like skating, you know, the ones who practice it all the time, like hockey players, are so attuned to it that it feels like walking, and then they can focus on the puck and gameplay itself. 
Now for tip number two, DPS mechanics and combos. So one easy way to get damage on someone if they're quite close to you is boop them up in the air and then shoot them as they fall down because their hitbox will move in a predictable line as they fall down from the air. Against flankers who have lower health, something you need to try and do is get as many boops and melees in as possible. So that's really effective damage and they can't be healed easily when they're in your backline. One short combo that you can do with this is booping and then immediately using your melee after. This will cancel some sort of animation. If you do it fast enough, then you can actually hit the boop and the melee, which is an easy 55 damage. That's a good tip there, and I'll add to the fact that since Lucio is a projectile-based hero, you really do have to lead your shots. So if you're doing the upwards boop and trying to land shots as they come down, you have to drag your aim ahead of them. Now for tip number three, rollouts. Well, kinda. Rollouts are definitely important both on maps with boot potential and to get back to point faster to assist your team. It's probably worth learning a few, but honestly I don't know too many because remember, if you just don't die, you don't need to learn rollouts. It's a good point, but obviously we're not all at Funny Astro level where we never die and never have to learn rollouts, but dying less is something you should strive towards so you can place less importance on learning rollouts and work on your fundamentals. And finally, tip number four, bad Lucio habits. The biggest bad habit I've noticed from watching lower ranked gameplay is the people don't shoot all the time. I'll often see lower ranked Lucios shoot one or two shots and then instantly reload. One trick you can use to like try and figure out if you're shooting enough is unbinding your reload and then seeing how much you're pressing R when you don't need to be. Accuracy is a pretty terrible stat to be looking at because Lucios should always be shooting. You'd be surprised at how much damage you can output if you don't constantly spam your reload and also when you're not dying all the time. Honestly, it's actually insane when you look at Funny Astro's stats compared to your average mid-GM Lucio player, such as myself. Look at one of his account's Lucio stats, with a massive sample size too. He straight up just does way more than me in every category and dies significantly less. There's a lot to be said about learning Lucio at the highest level. I mean, I sure learned a lot collaborating with him on this video, and I hope you guys did too. That's all from us. See you guys next time. Thanks for having me, Kaku. You can find me on twitch.tv slash funnyastro, where I usually stream Monday to Saturday from 7am to 2pm Eastern Time, which is 1 to 8pm European Time.